Oh my goodness, y'all, it's okay. Everybody is halfway through the work week. I feel like I'm at a funeral or something. Just <laughs> It's just like really somber. You're freaking me out. All right, y'all trying to make me nervous or something? Oh, man. Take your Bibles. Uh, zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> zero. All right, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I feel like a substitute teacher, like uh, the first day of school or something. All right. Ephesians chapter number 2. Oh, by the way, I made that, I made the uh, joke about the thing because I looked on the schedule in the back and I saw basically everybody that was going to be there had already signed up, so it was safe. It was an educated, it was an educated joke, all right? So uh, Ephesians chapter number two, Ephesians chapter number two, we were in there on Sunday and uh, we got down here where we talked about the household of God. And, uh, and then we made some comments in verse 20 about you're built upon a foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone of that. And uh, I really kind of want to bring a practical uh, bow on this subject of the, uh, of the body of Christ and uh, being a part of the household of God, because uh, what we talked about on Sunday night was the, the household of God as far as in the grand scheme of of time, from the beginning of time and to the end of time, starting, you know, with uh, starting with um, the saved Gentiles before the law, right, and then ending with the millennial saints, and how you have a goodly heritage all the way through, and you're a part of that, right? And then before that, on Sunday in Sunday school, we talked about the body of Christ and how that is uh, seen in the and 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 people are baptized into. The body of Christ via spiritual, um, and we see how that comes into play there, and was made available at uh, the crucifixion at Calvary, and then the Holy Spirit, the promise of His coming, happening in Acts chapter two, um, when people are starting to get placed into the body of Christ. All right, and but uh, there's I think a, a greater practical application here, uh, as we see in the end of this. Um, chapter when he says, and we'll read verse 20 again, uh, built on the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Let's uh, go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this evening. I pray, Lord, as we open up the Word of God, Lord, that you would please uh, give us understanding. Father, give us guidance through the Holy Spirit and help us, Lord, to uh, encourage and help us to uh, uh, inform. And whatever it is you want to get done tonight, we pray that you would do just that. Father, we're a needy people. Uh, Lord, the world, we're halfway through our work week, Lord, and the world is uh, beating down on each and every one of us, Lord. And, and I pray, Lord, that uh, for the next few moments that there would be a reprieve, Father, that there would be... Uh, uh, calm, and Lord, we can just absorb the Word of God and whatever it is you have for us here this evening. So Lord, I ask you to wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive, and we pray you bless the opening of the Word of God now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, a building, uh, as far as what he's using here to show how the body of Christ works, and if you've ever done any kind of building, and he alludes to it that it's framed together, um, or the foundations, uh, of course, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, being the, the uh, bedrock of the church, the head of the church, the firm foundation, and uh, there's no foundation that is laid that any man has laid, uh, but Jesus Christ. And the blessing is, is that uh, since the crucifixion and the ascension and the foundation that was laid on Calvary, the Bible tells us over in uh, Corinthians, he tells us that we can build thereupon, right? And because we can build thereupon, uh, he's saying that the apostles and prophets, they started building on it, and then the next generation built on it, next generation built on it, and you and I, as far as a collective is concerned, are building upon uh, the foundation that was laid many, many years prior to us. Now, the personal side of that is that just like... Uh, just like the church as a whole, 
in your life, there was a day that you came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and you were then, uh, the Lord picked you up and placed you on a firm foundation of Jesus Christ and established your goings and those kinds of things. And now you, in your personal life, can now build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we know that the ultimate judgment of that is culminated at the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, it's at that judgment that, uh, they, that all the things that you choose to do in this life are then judged and they're tried uh, yet so as by fire, right? If any man build upon their gold, silver, precious stones, he'll receive a reward. And if any man build upon that foundation, wood, hay, or stubble, he shall suffer loss, but yet he himself shall be saved. Right? Yet so as by fire. Therefore, again, affirming that, uh, that you're eternally secure no matter what decisions you make after you're saved. Okay? So the doctrinal stance is still the same. But the practical side of it is, is that you have the opportunity to build something in your life. You have an opportunity. You have to understand that before you were saved, the Bible tells you in Romans that you were free from righteousness. You ever thought about that verse? That means that man at his best state is altogether vanity. That means you as a saved person, listen, uh, you actually have the ability to do right now. Because before you were saved, I don't care how big of a do-gooder you were. I don't care how many old ladies you helped cross the street. I don't care how much money you gave to charity. I don't care. The best intentions you had amounted to a whopping nothing burger. <laughs> Do you understand why the, 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 the message of the gospel is so offensive? Because in order for you to receive the message of the gospel, you have to understand that all the good works that you have done in your life prior to your salvation mean absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of eternity. You ever met some good lost people? I have. Man, I, and, and they're nice folks. <laughs> and they care about people. And they got a big heart, Right? For what? For nothing. The Bible says they're free from righteousness. And the more you try to earn righteousness, the further away from righteousness you become because you become self-righteous. Does that make sense? And self-righteousness is rooted in pride. And pride is the number one sin that God hates. <laughs> you understand? That was the sin that got the devil kicked out of heaven. And so you meet the nicest do-gooder on the face of the planet. If that person is not saved, I don't care how good they are. They're nothing. But you, having a foundation in Jesus Christ, you can now, whatever you do good, you do it for the glory of Jesus Christ, and you can receive a reward for the works that you do in the flesh. I want to give you a, a, a couple things here, because when we think about this, he, he likens the body of Christ unto a building that is fit together. A building ain't worth nothing if it doesn't have a good foundation and you can't get a better foundation than Jesus Christ. Amen. And no matter what you choose to do with Jesus Christ in, the, in your personal life, uh, the foundation that he has laid for the church, universal, uh, guess what? You're not going to shake that foundation no matter what you choose to do. You ever see a Christian get bitter with God? You ever see it happen before? circumstances, whatever it is that happened, somebody didn't say hello to me, someone didn't shake my hand, I don't like the way things happen, the, the decision that was made in the church, someone so made a joke at the beginning of the service and it wasn't, you know, I didn't like it. <laughs> you know, all those kinds of things that can get somebody mad at you, right? And they get bitter with God. You ever met them? And, what they, and then what they do, it's almost like a kid that's mad at their parents and so you know what, they, they do something purposely to get underneath their parents' skin and kind of like get them back. You ever seen that happen before? Yeah. You ever seen that happen before? Yeah. Of course you have. If you're a parent in here, you've seen it happen before. You know, they give you a snide look. They give you a... <sighs> they do something or they don't do something that you want them to do because just out of spite because they're mad. You're not hurting God. You're not changing, listen, you're not affecting the foundational uh, uh, chief cornerstone of the church. You're hurting yourself. <laughs> you're not hurting Jesus at all. You're not getting back at God for your circumstances. You're not teaching God a lesson. <laughs> right? You're hurting yourself. <laughs> but, I mean, like I say, uh, he, he likens it unto a, unto a building and the foundation is sure. And he says that this building is fitly framed together and groweth 
unto a holy temple in the Lord. Now, we know that the temple, um, for you and I, the temple, uh, we, we call this the house of God, and people say that, and I don't get mad at people for saying that. I think that there is something special about the sanctuary that we meet in. I think that you should treat it a certain way, and there, you shouldn't do certain things in here and that kind of stuff. I believe that you should have reverence for the things that's God's stuff, right? Do we believe this is God's stuff? I believe this is God's stuff. And I think that we should take care of it like it's God's stuff. We should treat it and reverence it like it's God's stuff. It's not, it's not uh, an idol, Amen. Right. right? But it's still God's stuff, okay? But the house of God, the temple of God is you. It's your body. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a personal application, and then there's a, there's a universal application. And if we go to the universal application, we see that there's all kinds of parts that go into a building a house. I don't, I don't care. Um, you could buy a kit home. You could have a custom-built home. I don't care if it's, just a, if it's just a pergola or if it's a pavilion or something like that. The material list on those things is a mile long, right? And there's so many different things that it takes to take something and make it la build it so that it lasts. You ever see something that's not built to last? <laughs> it just falls over and you shake it, you know? I remember we, uh, we played paintball one time and we built a, uh, we had, well, in my mind, I had this idea for, you know, like a, like a tower. You know, you could climb up in the tower and shoot people and stuff like that. So we bought some wood and uh, we dug four holes and stuck some posts into it. You say, was there concrete in those? No. Nope, we just snugged it up with some more dirt. <laughs> we put some two-by-fours in it and cross-framed it, put some plywood on it, you know. And uh, we let people get in it, but I didn't advise them to get in it. <laughs> You'd walk up the ladder and that thing would rock back and forth. And I'm like, that's a liability. You know, that's a liability. Why? Because it wasn't built right. <laughs> right? It wasn't built right. But, but listen... He says that the building is fitly framed together, the material list is long, and when you build it right, that thing can last a long time. But every one of the pieces that goes into that building is there for a reason. And it has a purpose. You know, and like uh, you talk to, you know, there's certain things you build and you put screws in it. There's certain things you build, you put nails in it. And nails are actually stronger than screws uh, especially when you're framing a house, you'd never frame a house with screws. Those screws would shear off. Those nails, man, they get in there and they hold it together and they have a little bend to them, they have a little bit of give to them, and, they, and they, make that, they make that house stronger. You would never build it with screws. But unless you build something with a bunch of screws and has screws start shearing off, you never realize the importance of that little nail. I know there's some houses up uh, where I'm from, uh, even the house that I was raised in, uh, it still had them like uh, them them square, you know, screws. They used to like hand beat them out and stuff like that. I mean, those things, <laughs> those things last over 100 years, man. I mean, those things are, you know, like sticking steel rods in <laughs> their stuff. And uh, they held that house together. And so I, I want to say, take your Bibles, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, because there's a, there's a principle that's being laid out here. And I think it's really, really important that we get it because... You and I belong to a local assembly that's made up of a bunch of little different parts. And everyone may have a different, you know, position, a different responsibility, a different, uh, you know, purpose. But without everybody, the thing can't stand. And, and, that's, and that's really the, the practical lesson of, of the body of Christ. I understand the doctrinal stuff. I understand that I, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places and I'm eternally secure and I'm bone of his bone and I'm flesh of his flesh and I rejoice in all of those things. But the, uh, the practical side of this is to help you and I in, the, in, this, in this thing that God has put us in in the local church together. And, uh, and it does extend past our own, lo our own local church. Um, but I'd like to liken it under this tonight. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look in verse number 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body being many are one body, 
so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. All right, so the first thing here is we see that for you to be a part of the body, right? For you to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ, uh, for you to get into it is a working of the Holy Spirit. He, makes, he pulls no punches about it. Uh, for as the body is one and hath many members, all members of that one body being many are one body, and so also is Christ. And it's a spiritual thing. Now, there is a doctrine that's being taught out there, and I want to clarify it because I don't want you to get twisted of, you know, I, I don't want to liken it under this, but then we're talking about the body and that kind of thing. There's a thing called Baptist briders out there, and what they believe is that when you get baptized in water in the back of the church, that's how you, that's how you join or that's how you get placed into the body of Jesus Christ, uh, and, and, you're, and you're doing that in a, and you're a part of that local church. And basically... Uh, if, you, if you leave this church and go to a different church, you have to become rebaptized because you left the body. And so they make the body about the local church. So what they do is they confuse the spiritual body of Christ with the local body of Christ. Does that make sense? And that's a, actually a very popular teaching. Uh, that's not, it's not some little thing. It's pretty widespread. And I've, met, I've actually met... Uh, a lot of guys that believe just like that, and um, that's wrong. Now uh, you can there's there could be people in this church right now that are not that are not saved, right? You know, that happens all the time. You probably ask Brother Dave. He's probably seen people that were members of churches for years and years and years, and then walk an aisle and get saved one day, and you're like, oh well, I thought so and so was saved. Well, not between them and God, they realized that they had a need for Jesus Christ and they had to get saved, right? And just because that person got baptized in the church doesn't mean they were placed into the body of Christ because that's a spiritual thing that has to take place. And the only people who know if you're really saved is you, God, and the devil. You understand? Now, I'm not talking you out of your salvation, but that's just the truth of the matter, right? Like I say, there can be people that uh, are religious. There can be people that believe in God. Right? And they're not saved. Just because you believe in God doesn't make you saved. Just because you're the member of the church doesn't make you saved. In order for you to be a part of the body of Christ, that is a spiritual baptism that takes place, and there is no water involved in that baptism. Now, we'll get into that when we get into Ephesians chapter 4. I'll go real deep on that and the different baptisms and all that stuff. And a lot of the times when the people talk about baptismal regeneration, whether that be Church of Christ or, or, uh, or, or other denominations that believe that, uh, that that is uh, a lot of times they're reading water baptism where there's no water anywhere in the passage, right? And so uh, we'll get into that in Ephesians chapter 4. But for the sake of this right here, that the, the, way, the way that you get into the body of Christ is a working of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing that you can do to, to become a member of the body of Christ and, uh, except for get saved and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's how you get into the body. And so that's, just, that's the common thread that we all have. That transcends personalities. That transcends preferences and different convictions and different things like that. There's, listen, folks, in a, in a crowd of this size, you, you probably have different convictions than what I have. Some of you in here have different standards than I have. Some of you in here, you probably, there's probably things that you believe. You've read your Bible and you believe certain things, how they should be, and you're probably a lot deeper and darker in your understanding of the Scripture than I am even. And you want to know something? The common thread that we have between all of us is the fact that we're saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And guess what? Amen. A lot of those things don't mount to a hill of beans when you actually boil it down to what the true connection is. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about forsaking doctrine and the things that we believe aren't important. Of course, you guys know that. Um, but uh, when it gets down to the, the issues that a lot of times we face in churches amongst the local church and the body of believers is uh, the stuff we fight over usually is never a doctrinal issue. They're personality issues. 
And a lot of times, if we could just get past the fact and realize it's not about, I don't care, you know, everybody's got different personalities and different preferences. And if you can learn how to, like, step back away from those things for a minute and say, okay, is this a doctrinal problem? Is, there, is this a chapter, verse issue? Well, if it is, then let's talk Bible. But if it's not, we're saved, <laughs> love God, okay? To the pure, all things are pure, and maybe we disagree on a certain thing. It's not a doctrinal thing. Okay, let's move on. Who cares? Amen. Right? How about having grace Amen. with people? <laughs> How about having grace with each other? How about when you see a new Christian and they don't know as much as you? Allow, hey, listen, they could be dead wrong. Can I ask you this? Would you allow them the grace to be wrong? You don't have to correct them the minute you hear something. They've been saved for like 15 minutes, <laughs> right? Amen. Just because you hear something that's wrong doesn't mean you have to correct it. Amen. You know, I just think about it. I mean, the Lord, I, I know that there's things that the Lord has allowed me to be wrong on. There's been things I've said from the pulpit many years ago that I would never say now. And I was wrong for saying them. Right? And I set them in front of really, really good preachers. <laughs> you know what they said to me? Nothing. You know what they said? Yeah, that was good preaching, brother. And they encouraged me. Because you know what they knew? That if I was called to preach, and this was something that I was committed to doing, the Lord, he'd, he'd shake it out. <laughs> he'd shake it out. <sighs> That's a hard one, folks. <laughs> That's a hard one. We all want to be respected by people. We all you know, like to be looked up to and somebody come to you for advice and all that kind of stuff. Maybe that's not what God wants you to do. Be careful. Not be many masters. Okay? Uh, that's, a, that's a burden that you shouldn't put on yourself. Okay? Uh, leave, that to, leave that to the different uh, members and we'll get into that here in, in a little bit. But it's important to understand that the baseline that we all have in common is the fact that we're saved by grace and that Jesus Christ is working on us and we have an indwelling Holy Spirit that has placed us in the body of Christ. And the sole purpose of that Holy Spirit, one of the sole purposes of that Holy Spirit is to lead you and to guide you into all truth and to convict you of sin, right? And righteousness, okay? That's... The Holy Spirit's job. He's the one that changes minds and changes hearts. Right? So it's really important that we understand that. And, it'll, and honestly, it'll take a lot of pressure off you than, you know, constantly uh, looking for stuff that you got to correct. <laughs> and it's okay when, you can, when someone can say something and you just allow them to be wrong. I know that that's hard. I know that that's hard. Um, but it's, uh, it, would, it would make you pray more and talk less. <laughs> Amen. Well, I see, we're, just, we're off on a great foot. <clears throat> I'm doing the best I can here. <laughs> this is a working of the Spirit. Let's look at number two here. <clears throat> he, it's, uh, it warns us of two different attitudes. This passage here describing the body of Christ, it warns us of two different attitudes that we can easily have as members of this body. Okay? Let's look at the first one here. Look in verse number 15. It says, If the foot shall say, Because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. It is therefore not of the body. If the ear shall say, Because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? You see that? You want to know the first attitude you have to be careful about as you're in the body of Christ and you're trying to walk with God and you're amongst other believers? You have to be careful of having the overwhelming attitude of, I am inadequate. I'm no good. I'm not talented like so-and-so. I can't do what so-and-so does. And if only I could do that, then God would use me. You ever seen people like that before? Yes. 100%. I think that's, that's a, that is a, uh, 
That is a pandemic in our churches. And I also think that it's an excuse that people hide behind because they don't want to do anything. Bingo. Man, I thought it was going to be so nice. <laughs> Listen, it's this, it's this attitude of, well, I'm not a preacher. I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. I'm so inadequate. I'm so feeble. I'm not talented. I... I just don't get it. When I can't memorize Bible. I can't, I can't preach. Always focus on stuff you can't do. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And you know what the, you know what the Bible tells us? He says, okay, well, uh, if, the, uh, if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, am I not of the body? There's no doubt. You may not be... You may not be a, an eye. <laughs> you may not be an ear. Maybe you're a fingernail or a pinky toe or something, right? But that doesn't mean you're in any less part of the body, right? Whatever happened to the people that said, I don't have these talents, but bless God, I'm going to figure out something that I can do because after all, he died for me and he saved my soul from hell and he gave me breath in my lungs, so I at least want to do whatever it is I can do for him instead of constantly looking at other people and telling yourself what you can't do. And then check your heart to say, eh, or am I just being spiritually lazy? Right? There's not one of you in here that can't pass out a gospel track. Well, I'm shy. When? <laughs> Who cares if you're shy? Do you have a job? <laughs> you have to, you have, listen, if you have a job, you interact with people, even if it's on a computer. Right? Listen, you can do something. Care how untalented you are. You all heard the illustration that Dr. Peacock gave, you know, at his dad's church and comes in and the lights are all off and he hears the ch -ch 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 -ch, and there's an old lady that's uh, crippled on her back and she's scraping the gum off the bottom of the pews. Suppose she said, Well, I can't preach, so I just can't do nothing. Right? A little woman in the Bible, all she got is two mites. Right? Well, I don't, have, I don't have tons of money like so-and-so does, and, and, I, and I don't have a, you know, a nice house, and I don't have a this, and I don't have a that. But do you got two mites? Well, could you give your two mites? Oh, well, I don't, I don't, have, a, I don't have enough to feed 5,000. I don't have enough to... Uh, what is this among so many? So do you think the solution is to keep it to yourself and do nothing? And leave it to the people that can provide those things. Or do you give your lunch and see what God can do with it? Does that make sense? That's, just, that's an attitude that's in the passage about the body, the practical application of the body of Christ. That is an attitude that we have to fight and we have to, and we have to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to get into that mindset because it's toxic. It'll put you at odds with other people and it'll make other people not want to be around you and then, oh, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll go eat worms. It's like, no, maybe it's like your attitude. Nobody wants to be around that. Constantly talking bad about yourself like you're lower than whale poop and all this different stuff and I just, oh, no, I'm so bad. I'm no good. I'm no good. Okay, get it. We all get it. You're a sinner and you're, you're, you're no good. You're no, whatever. Okay, we all are. <laughs> Shake it off, man. Get in the fight. Let's mix it up. Who cares? We're all fighting the same fight, ladies and gentlemen. Amen. And we all got different talents. We all got different places. But bless God, don't mean you're not a part of the body. Yeah. Right. Amen? There's another attitude he tells us to fight. Look with me, if you will, uh, in, uh, let's see here, verse number 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand... I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of thee, or no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. You see, you have to fight the attitude of inadequacy, but you also have to fight the attitude of arrogancy. 
Because what will happen sometimes is God just may give you the talent to sing. And God may give you the talent to preach. And God may give you the talent to do certain things and give you the ability to see things and, and uh, give you the drive that some people don't have. And God may put you in a position or God may do certain things where you, you tend to be the person out in front. Or maybe you're just busy doing things, right? You ever, you ever find somebody that's they're constantly busy? they got Martha syndrome. They're real busy, 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 busy. And instead of just being busy, they're busy and critical. So they're not just busy, but they're like, why aren't you doing what I'm doing? Yep. Right? Well, you know what? You know, and, then, and then when you offer help, they, they reject your help. Everybody nod your head because everybody in here has been around somebody like that before. Right? It's like, I don't need your help. Well, then why are you complaining to me about it? <laughs> right? I don't need you. I'm ahead and you're afoot. You see what I'm saying? It's a pretty rough attitude to have. You reckon that could probably cause some problems in the body? Right? Just because you see somebody, it's like all they do is come to church, they split out, they don't stay for the meals, they don't do this. You realize that there's some folks, that's just what, that's the way they are. Are we okay? You know what? You know what I used to And I still believe this, Okay. <laughs> I still believe that you should be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I believe that. Amen. That's a, that, is a, that is a fundamental thing that I have adopted in my own personal life. I've also, seen it, I've also seen people who have adopted it in their life, and I see the fruit of that in their life. Okay? They, they formulate their life around the local church, and they don't miss services unless they're sick or something's going on, right? Okay? They're in church when the doors are open, and that is an important thing in your life. Yeah. Amen. Right? But I've preached sermons and preached at people that aren't in the pew. Right? Because guess what? There's some people, they can only make it to Sunday morning. And there's some people that you're going to have in church, and guess what? No matter how much you poke, prod, shame, scream, spit, whatever you do. They're going to come on holidays. They're going to come, uh, 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 they're going to be sporadic, right? You know what I've had to learn? That's, 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 it's okay for them to be them. I don't agree with it, right? I think that they would be better off if they did come to church every time. But when they come to church, do I just make it a, do I make it a time to, that's my time to ostracize them. That's my time to really get in on them. Or do I allow them to come and hopefully one day God will change their heart and maybe they'll be here at every service. Does that make sense? Well, because you're not like me, I don't want you around. That's the attitude he warned us about. That's the attitude. I've heard a lot of preachers say that. Listen, you ain't come all three services. I don't want you to come to none of them. What? That's crazy. That's crazy. You know, I heard uh, Dr. Ruttman said this about uh, there was an issue going on in church at the time. And the um, uh, and pastor tells a story about it. But there was another story. This, uh, when I was in school, same exact thing. There was an issue with family and stuff like that, and it had gotten, and you know how sometimes problems in the church, they escalate, and then they have to be addressed and all that kind of stuff. I understand all that stuff. Church, church discipline and church this, that, and the other. That's all scriptural, and it's all in balance, and it's all good, right? Now, listen, some church members don't have a stomach for that, but that doesn't make any difference. It's still biblical, and it should be done, all right? And nobody looks good. The pastor is in an impossible situation when he has to do things like that, but he has to do things like that. Why? To protect everybody else. And there's always collateral damage when that kind of stuff happens. But there was a situation that was coming, and everybody was putting pressure on him to basically church him, church him, church him, church him. And he says, well, how come you haven't church him yet? He says, well, they're still in church. They're still listening to preaching. Why would I kick them out? They're not doing anything that requires me to kick them out. Why? Well, as long as they're in church listening to preaching, whether it's once or twice a month, they're still in a place where, do you realize that there's, it takes one sermon to change your life? Yeah. Yeah. It could take one good church service for the light bulb to come on in some of your hearts. Yes. Just one. 
It's like, oh man, praise the Lord. The light bulb just went off and I need to change something. Right? Why would we kick them? Why would we say, well, you're not the head. You're the pinky toe. And we don't want pinky toes around here. Right? Well, that's not a good attitude. <laughs> that ain't helping anybody. It just makes you arrogant. <laughs> makes you somebody that uh, thinks you're more highly and thinks of yourself more highly than you ought to think. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 to watch out for them folks. Because a haughty spirit comes before a fall. And so you got to be careful. He tells us to be careful of a spirit or an attitude of inadequacy and an attitude of arrogance. The big me, little you syndrome. You see that a lot. You know, I've been saved for a million years and then they, they talk down to everybody that's, that's you know, they, they see as lower than themselves. Some of the greatest preachers I've ever been around, they don't talk down to folks. They uplift people. Because guess what? Can I tell you something? Maybe, maybe you're a foot right now. You know what? I've met a lot of foots that are hands now. Does that make sense? There's a lot of people that start down here and then the Lord brings them up here. I don't want to be the one that keeps them there. I want to be the one that says, Hey, listen, man, if you keep at this thing and you keep doing this, man, the Lord can, who knows what the Lord can do with you? Amen? And then you rejoice when God takes a foot and, you know, brings him up, makes him a rib or something. <laughs> it's like, man, Lord, look what you're doing in that guy's life. I would have never thought of that. You think the first time Brother Dave stepped in church, they were like, you know what? I see an evangelist in him. <laughs> no way. He didn't even see it. But thank God, God likes to take the low, and if they humble themselves, he brings them up. Amen. Right? You don't want to be the one that stunts somebody's growth because of your attitude. Well, if that's the way the Christians are up there, I don't want to be like them. Bunch of arrogant jerks. I don't want to be like that. He reminds us in, uh, let's see here, verse, verse number... Um, Oh, let me see here. Verse 18. Put a bow on this point. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body. Look at this. As it hath pleased him. Wait, wherever you're at in the body right now, can I say this? That's where the Lord puts you. And you had no say in it. So how in the world could you say you're inadequate? And how in the world could you be prideful of where you're at? Because God placed you there as it hath pleased Him. So just like salvation, where you're at in the body is completely neutral. And you're not judged based on quantity. Well, so-and-so had opportunity. How in the world, how in the world uh, if, if I try to com compare myself to D.L. Moody? Right? Why? I'm not D.L. Moody. Nor do I have the opportunities that D.L. Moody had. How could I be judged uh, 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 pound for pound for, with D.L. Moody if I was judged by quantity? But you want to know something? The preacher that's led hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people to Christ has to be judged alongside the, the widow that never stood behind a pulpit and passed out tracts and had done what she could. And so God judges you on quality based on where he placed you in his body. Amen. So you can rejoice in where you're at. And if God allows you to be more someday, then you rejoice. That, that's what Paul did. He says, I rejoice in what? That God accounted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. <coughs> Whatever ministry that is. Right? And so with that said, he reminds us who to watch for. Look in verse 23. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath, uh, hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. You know what? He tells us to watch out for 
those that are way down, the calmly parts, the, the ones that we would deem to be not as important, the ones that are less visible, right? He tells us, you better watch out for those folks because you want to know something? Those folks, they, they're, they're worthy of double honor. They're worthy of more abundant honor. You ever think about, uh, I just, because he's not here, you ever think about Brother George? That man was was faithful for years and years and years, him and Miss Linda sitting right back there, right? For the longest time, he was not able to be here. And now he's able to be here, what, one service a week, in and out of a nursing home, getting ready to move back in there, bad health, loses his Miss Linda, all this kind of stuff, Right? All the responsibilities that Brother George used to do around here, which were many. Brother Mike, he's probably, he's had to, he's had to forego a lot of those, right? Yes. Almost all of them. Miss Sandy's doing the donuts. Yeah. Brother uh, uh, Barry doing the trash cans or whatever. Brother Jerry doing the trash cans, the sign, all that kind of stuff. All the stuff Brother uh, uh, um, uh, George used to do. From an outside looking in as far as input to the church. You say he's calmly part. You know what the Bible says? God says they're worthy of abundant honor. You want to know? I think there's a reason why. Because if you're Brother George, probably be good. Somebody come up and say, hey, I appreciate everything you've done, brother. I sure appreciate all the years that you, when you were able to do it, you did it. Right? I think about Brother Tom. Not able to be here a lot. That nursing home a lot, Miss Joy. Right? Can't tell you the amount of times he's come up to me and said, Brother Joe, I wish I could be here. I wish I could be here. You know what? I tell him the same thing every single time. Brother, we love you. Amen. And I'm glad that you're here when you can be here. Amen. Right? Amen. You want to know why? They need some encouragement, man. Amen. You ever think of the folks that wish they could do more stuff, but they can't? Or the people that don't have the abilities... And they think, they're on the, they think they're on the shelf. But really, just them being here when they're here is a blessing. And the fact that they don't street preach and the fact they don't get behind a pulpit and the fact that they don't do this and they don't do this and they don't do this, hey, guess what? Aren't we happy that they're here? Amen. Doesn't them just being here make a difference in the church service when you got people to preach to in the pews and you got people to shake hands with and there's people here? Doesn't it do something for the young people to see him here? Yes. Amen. Amen. And so, you know what the Bible tells us? You should watch out for those kind of people. And when, guess what? When you get the opportunity, when was the last time you encouraged somebody? When was the last time you encouraged somebody like that? He says, you need to watch out for those that, you know, maybe the ones that aren't out in the forefront, the ones that do a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you don't even know. The Bible tells us to know them that labor among us. Do you know them? I challenge the young people. Do you know the people who labor among you? I think it's important. Take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 16. Paul practiced what he preached. Romans chapter 16, look in verse, uh, verse 8. Greet and Pilus, my beloved in the Lord. Salute, salute uh, uh, your bane and uh, our helper in Christ and Stachys, or <laughs> My beloved, salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus. Household. Salute Herodian, my kinsman. Greet them that be of the house of Narcissus. That's a rough name. <laughs> Which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena, the Tryphosa, who labored in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Salute uh, Is, uh, Isenchristus, <laughs> Phlegon, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are uh, with them. Salute Philo, 
uh, Philologus, <laughs> Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The church of Christ salute you. You say, why would you read all those words and butcher all those names? Because Paul thought it was important to put them in the Bible. Not one of you seen sermons preached on them, folks. Unless you got one by one, one by, uh, somebody who took a verse and took a fit and got got you a sermon on Rufus or something, right? You say why? He saw the calmly parts and said, "I want people to know who they are. They're worth mentioning. It's important to mention them because they're worthy of more abundant honor. Why? They didn't need the spotlight." And sometimes it was maybe a meal that was made and a word fitly spoken. Maybe it was just their presence in the church that Paul was preaching in and he saw that they were a faithful member and they were there every time the doors were open for many, many years. And Paul says, you want to know something? Salute them. Why? Because if nobody else will recognize them, I just want you to know, the big dog preacher, I recognize you and I see your sacrifice and I see what you're doing and I want to encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. And I want everybody to know that they should honor you for your sacrifice. You don't know what any of them people did. But he says, I want to make sure I give a list of those people and record their names in the Bible that the Bible says it's, it's, it's settled in heaven forever. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? That's important. Last thing I want to show you. He shows us how to walk in unity. He shows us how to walk in unity. Look in verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. You know, when we talk about being a part of something, you know, and I was uh, talking to uh, Brother Dave today and, and uh, you know, he's talking about being a part of the club and that kind of thing. And he says, you know, we were dedicated to each other. We'd fight for each other. You know, we'd make sure we we're taking care of each other. We had each other's backs. He says, loyalty is, is bred into me. Right? Wish it was that way in the church too. It should so be named that that's, that's, that's the characteristic of the church too. And he says, and I do the same thing in the church. Like, Nobody talks bad about the folks in my church. Amen. Right? If you have a problem with somebody in the church, uh, do people feel comfortable coming to you and talking about it? Why? You ever wonder why you're the person they feel comfortable talking to about that? Maybe it's something about you and less something about them. Yep. Amen? It talks about if we're going to walk in unity one with another, we have to have care and we have to have concern for one another. Right? Go to Philippians chapter 2. These are all things you all know. Philippians chapter 2. Look in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. That's you and I. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other more or other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You say, what is that? Caring about other people over yourself? What kind of like in the church? Why? Because we're part of the same body. <laughs> we're part of the same club. Right? What did he say back in the last verse the, where we were just at in, in, in Corinthians? In verse 27, but ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Doesn't it feel good to be a part of something as prestigious as the body of Jesus Christ? 
Well, that's a selfless organization to be a part of. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Right? But esteem others better than yourself. Look on the needs of other people. Care, genuinely care about other people and where they're at, what they're going through, what their needs are. I tell you, I, 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 and I say this, Brother Jake, I, I so appreciate it. There's been, there's been three times here recently where I've called Brother Jake and said, Brother, I'm really sorry. I need, to, I need to go get a lawnmower. I need to bring my lawn. I had to bring my lawnmower. My lawnmower broke. I had to bring it down to a place to get it fixed. I don't have a truck. I don't have a trailer. And you want to know something? I've called Brother Jake three times, and that guy never even batted an eye. He says, yeah, brother, I'll come down. Shows up at my house. It's time he says it. And I'm thanking him left and right. And you know what? That's, a, that's probably a 30-minute drive for him. He comes down, and he goes. And you want to know something? That's such a blessing to me. Amen. I public, brother, thank you. That's a big, that's a big burden off my shoulders. Amen. Right? You know what it was? Coming down with this trailer, hooking it up. Got off work early today to come down so I could get it, so I'd have enough time to study before church tonight. He thought about all that. Now, I don't say that to say that none of you would do the same thing if I called you. I'm just saying he's the one I call because you want to know something? I know one thing about Jake. He'll do anything he can do to help somebody. Sucker's proven that. I just mean sucker in a uh, very respectful, loving way. <laughs> That's the Yankee affection coming out in me. I'm sorry. <laughs> if we call you a name, we like you. Okay? That's, the, that's how that works. Okay? And I appreciate that. How about this one? Look in uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. There's so much stuff on this and such a blessing. Romans chapter 12, look in verse 25. I mean, uh, excuse me, look in verse uh, tw- uh, 4, sorry, 12 verse 4. I mean, this whole chapter. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. that sound familiar? <laughs> so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to uh, uh, of the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on, teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, uh, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Did you just know that? that that's, that's, a, that's a grace that God gives you to have mercy with people? And the Bible says if you have that, if you have the grace to be that merciful with folks, then focus on that. Right? And do it with cheerfulness, not like it's laborious. Well, I'm being merciful. I'm having mercy on them. Is that the attitude of the merciful? (laughs) No. Right? Let love be without dissimulation. You want to know what the root word of that is? Simulation. What does that mean? Fake, not real. Don't love, don't don't pretend like you genuinely care for somebody. Genuinely care for somebody. Don't put on a show. Don't simulate it. Don't be fake. Don't be false. Let love be without dissimulation. Okay? He says... uh, Let me see here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor. Look at this. Preferring one another. I've said this before. Do you prefer to be people that are, do you prefer to be around people that are outside the church or inside the church? I hope so. I know some Christians that say, I love church and I love my church, and they prefer to be people, they prefer to hang out with people that don't go to church with them than folks they go to church with. Well, that tells me something. I'm not saying that you're a devil. I'm just saying that tells me something. Right? Not slothful in business. Why? Because you'll hurt people that way. He tells you, you want to be in business? Be honorable. Why? So that you don't hurt the people that that you go to church with. It's a testimony. 
Okay, he says, uh, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. What did he tell you over there? He says, if one uh, uh, member of the body suffer, we all suffer together. And if one person is honored, we all rejoice together. So when you're down, we weep with them that weep. We feel that pain. Right? And when God does something great in your life and you give a testimony, we rejoice together. Why? Because we're a part of the same body. Hallelujah. Don't, aren't you, isn't it feel good to be a part of something like that? People join the military. People join law enforcement. People that are on uh, high-level sports teams. There's all kinds of careers that people get. Why? For the camaraderie. People get into all kinds of... You ask, you ask Brother Dave, the camaraderie is addicting in that kind of setting. You crave it. You thrive in it. It's what makes doing hard things manageable. It's the camaraderie with those you do hard things with. Because when you win, you win together. And when you lose, you lose together. And you uplift one another. And you can call each other out. Hey, brother, I don't know about this, but I may, maybe you're just having a bad day. But, uh, you know, let's get them next time. Encouraging one another. You weep with them that weep. You rejoice with them that rejoice. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. But condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Walk circumspectly, it says in another place. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Do you seek peace? Or does chaos follow you wherever you go? Are you always in turmoil? Are you always in a state of anger and conflict? Drama is the operative word. Are you always a part of those things? Let me ask you. How much effort do you put in just living peaceably with everybody? Now, the reason he said it the way he did is because there's sometimes you can't. And there's sometimes you got to call the baby ugly and you got to, you know, deal with things head on. I get that. He's not, he's, not, he's, not, he's not talking about this love, love, and you just love, and we'll just love each other, and then we'll love. That's not what he's saying. He's saying as much as lies within you, try to be at peace with folks. Don't be in the drama. Don't gossip. Don't stir the pot. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. What are we talking about? How do we walk in unity with another, one another as the body of Christ? How about this? Just suffer a little bit. Don't avenge yourself. I need to clear my name. Why? Just relax. It'll blow over. The Lord, if the Lord wants you to be rectified, uh, wants the situation to be rectified, wants you to be clear, the Lord, the Lord will bring it to pass. Sometimes time is the greatest healer. And you ain't going to be able to fix whatever happened in a two-day conversation. Can't do it. Some things take years to mend. Boy, I've learned that. It's hard. You wish you could fix it, but you can't. you got to just suffer it. Right? Give place under wrath. Why? Let somebody be mad at you. Because you don't want to hurt somebody. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. I like this. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Be good to folks. That's, hey folks, you want the pinnacle of the temple? Right there. Not how much Bible you know. Not, not anything like that. That's the pinnacle of the temple, right? Loving one another. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ rejoices in, right? 
You say, all I'm trying to do is put a bow on this topic of the body of Christ and being a part of the same building and being fitly joined together. We'll end back here in Ephesians chapter 2 and we'll shut it down. I just, I wanted to get through this because I want to stop saying Ephesians chapter 2 when I get up here. (laughs) And whom all, verse 21, and whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You say, why did you say all that? To say this. You want God here? I do. When we have church services, you want God to show up? Amen. Amen. Hey, when we sing, you want God to show up? When we pray, you want God to show up? Listen, when we come here in midweek and we're all just kind of sagging and magging and dragging in here, I get it. You still want God to show up and give you something to get you through the rest of the week? He told you how to do it. What is that? Walk in unity one with another as a building fitly framed together? Why? Because his desire is that it will be a habitation of God through the Spirit. The Lord wants to dwell where two or three are gathered. There I am in the midst. God wants to be here. And the way he gets here is when we come together in unity with a desire to see him. And we put all the other stuff aside and we learn how to be with one another and exist with one another and love one another. And God says, I'm going to show up right in the middle of that thing and I'm going to feel welcome there and I'm going to meet with you there and it's going to be sweet. And that's what I want church to be. And that's what you ought to want church to be. And God says, this is how you do it. (laughs) Being a part of the body of Christ. (laughs) What a blessing. And then when you go somewhere for a meeting, you know what you find? It's the same thing there. And you can meld in wherever you go. Amen. Praise God for that. Doesn't that make you feel good? Amen. You go to work tomorrow and you're like, I don't like anybody I work with. Hey, praise the Lord, we got each other. <laughs> we'll be back here on Sunday. <laughs> right? Well, I hope this encouraged you tonight, folks. I, I enjoyed studying it out. I hope you get a blessing from it. And so uh, let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and we'll take some prayer requests. Heavenly Father, again, I want to thank you, Lord, for the book. I want to thank you, Lord, for these folks that have come out. And I pray, Lord, that uh, they got something to chew on tonight. I pray, Lord, that you'd encourage us all. Some of these truths are so simple, but, God, they're so hard to implement. They're simple, but they're not easy. They're against our flesh. Uh, Lord, it's an impossibility sometimes to get a room full of this many people in different backgrounds, different ages, different experiences, different personalities. It's a miracle that it happens at all. But, Lord, help us to continue to work on it. Help us to continue. Lord, may Anchor Baptist Church be a place where you feel welcome at all times. And you show up and you meet with us. Because, God, we desperately need you. And we want this place to be an oasis to the members here and to the folks that come in and come out or new people that come in, Lord. We want them to feel the same oasis that we feel when you come and show up. And so, Lord, help us to be mindful of these things that were brought out tonight. And I pray that we'd be closer to you and closer to one another for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.